Tenako Tokato. Good evening and welcome into the breakdown. What a wonderful weekend of rugby we've witnessed. A sellout at Eden Park yesterday for the first ever Women's Rugby World Cup on New Zealand soil. Chelsea Simple's coming on the programme to talk about the entire occasion, the legacy and the results. We've got Ian Foster joining us on the breakdown as well to break down the end of year tour squad that has just been named for the All Blacks. Plus, the NPC semi finalists have been found a big team uh, with a big upset over the weekend. Bay of Plenty. Mm, that's right. We've shaken things up on the panel as well. Sir John Kerwin joins us. Joey Wheeler, Isaac Boss, great to have you all joining us. But first, let's talk about the wonderful occasion at Eden Park yesterday. JK, you were there. How incredible was that? I loved it. I thought it was fantastic. What an atmosphere, a different vibe. Mm. And I was talking to someone about it, and it, uh, it is a little bit of a different vibe and a different game, and I just love it. I think really exciting. I thought it was faster than the men's game, to be fair. Yeah. A lot more rugby. Um, and I just thought it was a great, great occasion, especially for our Wahine who, who who started a bit shaky. I was a little bit worried there, sitting there, Joey, <laughs> oh, thinking, yeah. oh, oh don't nearly. spoil the party, girls. Oh, but uh, came right, and so that was good. And we'll talk about that later, I guess. Yeah, I think the occasion maybe got a little bit the better of them at the start, all the emotion. But for me, I, I, was, I was amazed that I actually felt a little bit emotional for, for them because looking at our Wahine Toa and the pride and the passion that they have for that jersey, but playing in front of the biggest crowd of their lives in such an occasion on the, on the world stage, you could see what it meant to them. And for me, that just filled my heart. And, and I didn't think I'd feel that way, but I, I loved it. And I loved um, the game, like you said, JK, it was a real spectacle. Um, uh, the drama of that, that it didn't go all the um, Black Ferns way. You know, I thought, oh, we're going to give these um, the Wallaroos a hiding because we have never lost them before. But they came out of the gates, they challenged the haka. All that was just absolutely brilliant. Made the occasion so special. Yeah, yeah loved it. Yeah, that haka, though, <clears throat> same, I got emotional during it, you know, or started getting those tingles. It was, mm. it was immense. And the crowd, you're right, JK, it was different. It was kind of fanatical uh, mm -hmm. during the game. And I was just going, this is, this is different than what we see for an All Blacks match or a, a men's international. And as the game went on, those hits, yeah. the speed of the game, it was, it was top quality uh, rugby and it's showcasing the, the women's game. I'm looking forward to the rest of the tournament now. Oh, it awesome. was outstanding. I also just want to say congratulations to you, Aotearoa New Zealand, for filling that stadium as well. More than 40,000 people there at Eden Park yesterday. And boy, did those women deserve it. Uh, JK, for you, you've been at Sir Wayne Buck Shelford's tribute dinner last week. How was that for a legend of the game? Oh, uh, it was what was happening, you know, off the camera, just catching up with the boys <laughs> and... Uh, we were talking about it before, just meeting guys that you played with and having a laugh. Um, it really makes me so proud to have played our, game, our beautiful game because it was actually a laugh, a minute. And, and you know, Buck's been an amazing uh, role model for so many, both on and off the field. So it was neat to celebrate that with him and his whānau were there. And, and as, you know, as you can see from the photos, um, you know, the Navy of his past. So he had his family, the Navy people and rugby. And I, and I thought, and, you know, his community work with prostate cancer and stuff. So it was just a fun night, Joey. JK, you, he's regarded as probably one of the toughest All Blacks that's ever put on the jersey. You told a great story off here about <laughs> you seeing his... We all know about the obviously the scrotum incident, <laughs> but the uh, the head getting split open as well, right in front of you. I was there, and he I... just wanted Vaseline for that. Yeah, no, I was there for the <laughs> for the uh, scrotum thing, and just about vomited in the bath in the front <laughs> on a French tour. Um, but this time, uh, I was standing next to him, and I was obviously not dirty or anything, Joey. You know, <laughs> and one of the Australian guys opened up his head. And I saw here, I saw his brain, and then the blood started pulsating. I'm going, oh, but you know, <laughs> I might get dirty. But anyway, the, the, the doctor rang on, and, and um, Buck said, Give me some Vaseline. The doc looked at him and said, No, nah, no, nah, nah, mate, you need to get off the field. That's really serious. And Buck said, Give me some Vaseline, doc. The doc said, No, nah, mate, that's a big cut. You need to get off the field. And Buck said, If you don't give me the Vaseline, doc, they'll carry you off the field. <laughs> so so doc, doc pulls out the Vaseline, and Buck, Buck whacks it on his cut, and oh, away we went. So, yeah. Brilliant. Yeah, good that fun. is such a good story. Really? Such a good story. Uh, well, the All Blacks end of year tour team with 35 tough, strong men has been named this afternoon. A uh, very interesting look at looking team. Take a look at this. Not a lot of changes uh, than what we've seen earlier this year. But I suppose the, the major talking points to come out of this one, Anton Leonard Brown got through 45 minutes uh, with Waikato today. He has been recalled to the All Blacks. Braden Enor uh, is back in the mixer as well, not just as injury cover. Uh, no Angus Tarver 
Laval, no Patrick Tupolotu, Damien McKenzie, Brad Weber were another couple that we talked about potentially uh, being back in this team, but we haven't seen it. Bossy, what do you think of this team that's been named? Yeah, look, I, I think we've, we've seen no bolters, and I don't think we could expect to see any bolters where they've come from this year. They're just starting to get momentum, a new coach coming in, so players are starting to understand the new coach. And it's a dress rehearsal. This is not the time to, to throw guys in the mix to put every, all the hard work they've done in the last few weeks, or few months, sorry, at risk. So it's just those small steps to keep going ahead. Um, pretty much uh, what I expected, but it's great to see Anton Leonard Brown in there, who, who was, I thought was tremendous today. In the last couple of weeks, we've spoken about uh, potentially new guys coming in and maybe releasing Roger Tuivasa Sheikhs, the Stephen Petal Fetters, to this New Zealand 15 that will be named tomorrow. Where do you see these guys getting game time, Joey? Well, I think obviously the, the Japanese test is the obvious one, the first test um, on the end of year tour. But I also think that's, that's nerve wracking for me as well because this Japanese team, I know for a fact that they have been preparing themselves all year for this one test match. They've had two test matches against France in the lead up, they've had two test matches against Australia A in the last two weeks. So they are priming themselves to have a real crack at the All Blacks with the expectation that they're probably going to play their, maybe their B team, their supposed B team. So they're thinking, this is, our, this is our one chance to knock over the All Blacks and create a little bit of history for, our, for the Japanese. And we know, after what they did in the 2019 World Cup, JK, that this Japanese side, they're not, they're not a walkover like they used to be. Yeah, I don't care, Joe. Right, care. Well, if they lose? Um, no, I don't care um, about <laughs> Japan. I think that we only have 10 test matches to go, I think. And I've been saying that for a long time. I'm with Isaac. Like, we so results afford... don't matter on this? Well, they do, but if the players get out there and lose against Japan, then they You won't should... care, you won't be saying... No, no, I'll really care, yeah. but it's those players. For example, yeah. Hoskins Satutu, I think, is an outstanding young talent, going to be around for a long, long time. Um, what, do we want, what do we want to see from Hoskins? We want to see him go to the well a whole lot more, right? Yeah. Played really good against Australia, but probably got a bit tired towards the end. He needs to play against Japan, and he needs to go exceptionally well. Yeah. Peter Feta needs to play, and they need to beat Japan and they need to beat them well. And well, I mean, they'll play well Japan, and it might be three points. So I don't care about Japan. But, you need to see but, these but we've got to see these kids out play there. Play 80 minutes. And they've got to play 80 minutes, and they've got to win. Because I, I'm, with, I'm with you, Isaac. Like, we cannot change this team. I was hoping to see D-Mac in there just because I like him personally. I was hoping to see maybe a couple of changes. But at the end of the day, if, if you're Fozzie, you've got to go, we've got some new coaches here, we've got a settled side, and there's just no time left. Yeah. Mm. And I guess when you look at the, what they've got left, um, Bossy, they've got Wales, Scotland, then England after that, and you've got to think, well, if there's one test match, that they're going to um, give these guys a crack and to actually test them, because they haven't tested them throughout that whole rugby championship, really. Bit parts, these uh, bit part players have had a little bit of exposure, but in a real test match, go to the well, they're not going to get a chance against Wales, Scotland or England, are they? Boss, so that's the question, right? I guess, do you send, you know, Fakatava? do you send those guys with the second side or you take them like Fozzie's decided and then, you know, that's the decision, I guess. They need game time and they need, they need more game time than just against Japan. Whether that's, you know, we're guessing that he's going to throw those ones out against Japan, but they need to get put into the cauldron and in away matches in the likes of um, the Millennium Stadium in Twickenham because it's going to be twice that once they get to face these teams at the World Cup. And so we have to start developing um, the belief we've got it in the, that starting squad or that group. Especially now. against Northern Hemisphere yeah. teams as well because we weren't convincing on the last end of year tour and then obviously against Ireland at home, we are well below par. So, yeah, I think the only opportunity, oh, Japan, for these guys. No, I think Isaac's right. He's going to have to take some risk. Yeah. Got to put some guys out there. JK, uh, Roger Tuivasa-Sheik's been named as a midfielder. Geordie Barrett as an outside back. Do you see uh, those roles changing on this end of your tour? Yeah, I couldn't really understand, um, Roger, if it's true um, that Fozzie didn't call and say play on the wing, but we guess we can ask him. <laughs> um, yeah, I just, didn't think it, I just didn't think it was the right thing to do from Roger's point of view because I think... If he plays on the wing, I see him as the fourth best winger at the moment. I see him as a real contender and learning his position. That's the only reason that I wanted that, him to play. That's pretty generous if he's a fourth best winger because he hasn't played there. He's yeah. played two games for. No, I mean on the. I mean on this tour. So yeah. why would you play wing? Why wouldn't you yeah. stay at twelve and go? Actually, Anton Leonard Brown's coming back. 
you know, there's a few injuries there. I'm just going to settle that position. That's why I couldn't understand it from his point of view because I see him as a 12. I see him has some X factor at 12. His feet, fantastic. I think he could be world class there. And he's had a lot of bad luck as well. You know, we're talking about having to name a really solid and take no risks on the Northern Tour, but Rogers ha hasn't had a lot of time and not through his own fault. So spending three games on the wing, I just couldn't understand because I see him as a 12. Mm. Well, we can ask the head coach of the All Blacks now because we are so lucky to have uh, the time from Ian Foster. Ian, thank you so much for joining us uh, on your Sunday evening. Um, it's a year out from the Rugby World Cup. You have just named a 35-man squad. You'll take 33 to the Rugby World Cup. Is this as close as it gets to your World Cup team with a couple still to come out? Yeah, good evening, everyone. Look, uh, it's, you know, whilst we're planning with the World Cup, you know, we, we, we've also learnt the last, oh, well, I guess I've learnt the last two World Cups. So, yeah, you, you, you never, you always got to keep your options open in the, in the year leading into it. So, in 2015, 2019, each year we've sort of seen someone play their way in through the Super Rugby campaign that year. So, you know, options are still alive, but we've, you know, we've, we're looking at building on, a, a, I guess, a lot of the combinations we've had through in, in the rugby championship and taking that squad through and give them a different challenge up north. Fozzie, just before you came on, we were talking about RTS. I didn't agree with him playing on the wing, and I thought you might have given them a phone call to say, can I see him on the wing? So um, if you did, that'd be nice if you tell us. You don't have to, of course. But um, I see him as a 12. Where do you see him as, as, as the all-black convener of selectors? Yeah, uh, look, I did speak to Alama. I said if there was a chance to, to put him on the, on the wing at the end of the game, then I'd quite, it wouldn't do him any harm. I think... What, what he's got out of it, JK, is it's it's probably just given him a different view of the game. And I think for Roger trying to learn the game, I think it hasn't hurt him from that perspective. And I think that one of the reasons that I haven't minded it is because, you know, when you're looking at picking your 23, having a midfielder who can cover the wings also in, another feather on the bow. And so, you know, I, we still fundamentally see Roger as a midfielder and... But the fact that he could show some versatility at, at the wing, and when you look at his league background, he's obviously played in that backfield a lot. So, you know, well, I, I thought he handled it really well, and I just think that maybe gives us a few more options when we when we pick our 23. Fozzie, you alluded to that positions are still up for grabs going into yeah. World Cup year. When, when you talk about that, what positions are of concern for you going into next year and, and even this year? Yeah, I don't think concern is the right word now, Joe. You know, it's um, you know, but I think you, you never you never shut the door at, at, from an All Blacks perspective. You always want to, I guess, we're, we're always under pressure to, to look at players as they're performing, and and you know, like I like I said, you, you, we we can't predict the future about players playing out of their skin next year and sort of demanding that we look at them. But you know, overall, I think we've we've come into this year we've we've asked some. We've put a bit of a microscope over our front row. We've put a bit of a microscope, particularly over six and and over the midfield. And and overall, I think we've got some really good answers from those in those three areas through this campaign to date. And this tour coming up is a really good chance for us to cement that. So, for example, I think the form of Shannon Frizzell has been excellent. And you know, after a long injury, he's come back and played really, really strong and and almost demanded selection and. In, in, in the squad, and we'd love to see him grow. I think we've seen the likes of Fletcher and Newell, Tyrell Lomax, but Tyrell particularly, you know, he's he's jumped up a lot and sort of, and, and as a starting tight end, he's been he's been fantastic for us. And and then I think when you look at our midfield, well, we've had, I guess a lot's been spoken about with Geordie, and I loved his game at twelve. Um, but I also thought David Avili's form grew as as the season went on, and he started to show that triple threat game that we love with him. So we've got some good options in areas that perhaps we were, you know, we had to make decisions in this year. Yeah, Fozzie, you talk about the doors never closed and things like that, but there's also players within your squad that haven't played a lot of rugby lately. So I know you've specifically mentioned Peter Feta, you'll get a lot more game time. You've got Japan and then the three northern hemispheres. How do you balance making sure the likes of Peter Feta, Fakatava, Christie get a decent amount of game time on this, but you've got to get results as well? And the same with the wider squad through different positions. 
Yeah, yeah, great question, Isaac. And it's never easy, that that part of it. And, you know, part of being in a team is you don't always get the opportunities, you know, for everyone. But, look, certainly Stephen has, we, we think he's grown immensely through the last four or five months. You know, we've loved the way he's gone about his work. And, and the fact that he hasn't really got an opportunity was probably not a lot to do with him. But may, maybe some of those early results put us under pressure, you know, to keep the combinations growing. So... You know, I think you'll you'll see his name pop up in in the next test, and and then we'll certainly be trying to to give him another opportunity on tour. But um, you know, he's had a, two or three games back for Taranaki during the rugby championship, and that's been good for him. It's kept him in tune. And but he's a player with a big future, and clearly, you know, that was a selection. And you know, like Damian McKenzie was another one in that in that position that was. You know, we were looking at hard to, we've got a lot of faith in Damien as well, but we really feel like we owe Stephen an, an opportunity to, to, to show what he's learned. And and when we name that All Black 15, I guess it's a chance for, for Damien to come back in and to, to show his, his form in, in that team. Fozzie, are you going to be sending some of the players that might not get a couple of games back to the, to the um, you know, the other side? to play on the Thursday night, or do you want to keep your group together? Yeah, look, we're going to keep a large part of our group together, but there is a, a bit of a plan um, for some players to... We might drop a couple of players potentially back. Like, after we play Japan, we head up. There's a couple of guys that, at this stage, we might drop into the, the All Black 15 team to play against Ireland. And then they might come back to us and then there might be one or two more that go back into the Barbarians team. So, you know, there, there might be a case for us to put a couple each in each of those games. So the All Black 15 has got a squad of 28 and we also want, you know, that, that 28 to have a good opportunity. So it's balancing that. But yeah, JK, we will be doing a little bit of that as the tour goes on. Ozzy, your first game on tour is against, uh, obviously against Japan. They're a team that's on the up, obviously, and, and performed really well at the last World Cup. What's your policy in terms of your selection? What are you looking to do? Are you looking to select your, your A team, or are you looking to select your A minus team, or your B plus team, mate? What are you, what are you sort of, what's your approach to this game? Well, look, we, we we want to pick the strongest team we can, but you know we've got four tests in a row. Um, we've had a We've had a decent break, and 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 we've also got some players that didn't play a lot at, at the end of the rugby championship. So you add all those components together, and you kind of get the the uh, the combos that we're looking at. So there will be some players that haven't had a lot of time that that will get a chance against Japan, and 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 it's not just a, a one test to give people opportunity. It's also about people playing <coughs> for an opportunity to play in the next three. So. Um, you know, we're treating it as a as a as a standard test. And, you know, we know Japan has uh played really, really well lately and and they've been in camp for a long time, playing Aussie A three times. So they'll be ready for us. And and we're coming off uh, a bit of a, a break period. So that's why our camp next week in Nelson is pretty critical. It's a big week coming up. Yeah, Fozzy, just lastly, there's a few boys uh not available because of injury. Uh, Angus Tavel did miss out and he's not mentioned as uh, being uh, being injured, I know he's had a few head knocks and a couple of neck injuries and stuff, especially uh, in, in, on Friday night. Is is there a factor in a few players like Angus that they need need a little bit of a rest to, to get a few things right? Yeah, it could be Isaac. Like I mean, Angus, you know, I'm giving you guys a bit of a heads up, but I've already told you about Damien. So Angus will be in the the AB15 team and spoken to him today and. Uh, you know, him and his family are just they're just taking things quiet now as he gathers information. He, he he's in a good place, but um so he will get named because we think his, you know, he's a guy banging on our door, obviously, and it's a chance to have an experienced tight head up there, give him an opportunity. But if he's not right, then then he definitely won't tour. And so we'll work together with Angus on making that sort of decision because it really has to be one that the player leads that, that decision. And if he feels it's right to stay behind, then, then we're 100% behind that. Ian, thank you so much for your time. We appreciate you coming on the programme. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Fozzie. 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 Great insights, uh, great honesty from the man as well. Uh, so much to dissect and discuss when it comes to that interview. Uh,
Where do we start? Damien McKenzie, first and foremost. He will be named in the New Zealand A-team uh, or New Zealand 15 tomorrow, one of 28 players. Is he suffering from the second-year Japanese syndrome people talk about, JK? Well, no, you leave your All Black jersey to someone else and they're going to take it. So you take that risk when you go to Japan on your um, financial sabbatical, I call them. And, and he's come back and, um, you know, Stephen's taken his opportunity. And so when you're in front of the coach every day and you're improving and the coach tells you to do something, you go and work hard on it. Um, I personally like um, Damien because I think he gives us something different off the bench. Now, he will hate me saying that because all of us as players don't want to be bench players, but I think we missed him at the last World Cup because he's really special late in the game. He's got that X factor. Um, he can break down a defence. So that's why I love him so much. I think he'd be amazing. But if you're thinking about a solid 10 and a solid 15, then you're probably going, well, if Stephen's improving, that's what they're thinking about. Yeah, and agree. And I think this NPC has been good for him to get that time. But you watch how he plays for Waikato compared to what he would probably do in the All Blacks. He's he's leading that ship, so to speak. So he's playing a different type of role. Um, and, and I maybe this All Black 15. Now we know he's in it. He's probably going to play that leadership role in that group as well. So it's a chance for him to keep growing as a leader. He's not. He's already a leader, but. More importantly, it just gives him maybe with better guys around him, other influence as well, to actually just worry about his own game and not everyone else. Fozzie finally answered the question. He did tell Alama he would like to see Roger Tuivasa Shek on the wing. He was honest about that. Yeah, and that's interesting for me, JK, because you know he played. We well, only played a few games for the Blues at, at, at second five, and that's where we've seen him. But then to get thrown such late doors into the into the wing position, he said, you know, he can adjust to that because of his um, NRL background. But I, yeah, you know, I found that. Interesting. I, I would have liked to have seen him get more time in the saddle because he hasn't had a lot of time in the saddle at 12. I, yeah, I think I he said, I'll have to have a talk to Lama because I think he did say to Lama, 10 minutes, mate, at the end of the game. <laughs> yeah, Lama, Lama not listening to the all-black coach, mate. Yeah. Bloody hell, what's going on, son? <laughs> like he said, 10 minutes, not the whole game. But no, I, I actually think... I would love to see him. No, I think, it, I think it makes sense, though, Joey. The thing I liked about the response is, oh, I get that. OK, so they're probably going to pick him on more benches in the UK than anyone else because now he can cover Can't wing. Yeah, yeah. I mean, like Fozzie said, ideally it would have been nice to see him, you know, play 40 or 50 minutes and then go out onto the wing. But And you look at it too, he's coming back to a, an Auckland team that's probably quite settled. So, you know, you've got to take uh, exactly. into consideration yeah. their, their combinations and their campaign where he might say to them, look, we want to give him time. Give him time on the field anywhere. Like when you're a kid, just get me on the pitch, you know? So I think there's an element of that so as well. Man, I'd like to see him get dropped back into the AB's 15 a little bit too to, to get some more games time at 12. But the opportunity is there, the opportunity. right? Yeah. He said that, yeah. that players will be switching in between the two perfect, games. RTS perfect guy to do that, I think. No, I don't think he'll do that with RTS. No well, way? No. I just don't think he will. So I think what he, are I, the players that could switch? I, I, no, I think because he's now played on the wing, I think we'll be seeing him a lot on the bench and he'll be hoping to, by the end of the you, tour, you put, to give him a total him of 80 minutes. You put him in the Nuku basket and, and Leicester's played a hell of a lot more at centre than what Roger has and he's played a hell of a lot more on the wing. So yeah. those two then become competition for that spot, right? And at the moment, you've got to say, Leicester is the form player if they're going to go down that angle. Yeah, I get, I get that, quiet. Joey. I get that, Joey. But when you, look at the, when you look at the selection and the not sending these players already with that other side, they've made their decision. They really like the players that are, that are in front of them and they're going to give them every opportunity. So that's what I'm saying. I'm saying at the end of it, we know, I reckon we know more about Fa'a Nuku than we do about Roger. Mm. So I think at the end of this tour, if, if Fozzie and the selection um, group can go, we played four test matches, he ended up getting 80 minutes and boy, he was good. Mm. You know, because he's going to be the one they're going to have to make some hard calls on next year. Yes. I mean, if there's 32 going to the World Cup, there's four or five positions where it's going to be some big calls. So that's why the, the you know the second 15 and also this tour is fundamental. That's why that Japanese game's so big. Yeah. Well, I wanted to pick up on something you just said. They found their players that they like. 35 players. How do you break into this team a year out from the World <laughs> Cup when you have to drop players from this team? And there's more coming back. Your Ethan Blackadders, your Joe Moody's. There's still more players to come back into this team potentially. <laughs> yeah, there's, there's five or six not considered due to injury. There's a couple that are just not on form, and these already mentioned will be down in this All Black 15. But if you look at that, there's 16 backs there. They'll take 13 probably backs, um, maybe 14, sorry, and the rest will be forwards, uh, just the way they cover it. So all of a sudden, there is room to move, you know. One or two of those might be injured. In any year, there's probably about a 10% injury rate. It is so good. 
<laughs> Kirsty, it is the best thing ever. I've been a little bit older on an all-black tour and the young fellas are coming. I had an inger on one tour going, what's going on? And it just makes you better. So actually, for the first time, I'm really happy. The older guys are really going to have to perform. There's guys that are on the limit and they know if they, don't, if they mess this northern tour up and we know how hard they are, then they just get the, see you later. Can't throw it, but that is the business. <laughs> that is the business, isn't it? The ruthless business of professional sport. The All Blacks 35-man end of year squad has been named. Tomorrow, the 28-man All Blacks 15 team will be unveiled as well. When we come back, we talk about the Black Ferns' brilliant display at Eden Park. We're going to talk about the celebration, the festival of rugby, and who uh, else could pick up the title this year. But first, a wee jersey towel from one of the greatest of all time, Christian Cullen. G'day guys, uh, it's my turn for a jersey towel, so let's go see if we can find some. Okay, this is laundry, so I think they're in here somewhere. Oh, I've got a couple of bags full of jerseys there, so let's go have a chat. Spring box, no. Oh, the Wallabies one. We don't want to talk about that one. That's a uh, John Eels last minute penalty kick. Craig Dow, do you remember? We don't want that one. Ah, New Zealand Sevens. 1996, Hong Kong. Here's Cullen into space. And away he goes. So I went to Hong Kong 95. I played the first game, scored the first try, and then sat out on the bench and watched every other game. And we won, won that year, and it, I don't know, it just didn't sit well to me, you know, sitting on the bench, you didn't feel like, you know, we won Hong Kong that year, but it just didn't feel right. So I went home back to, uh, I was living in Manuel at the time, hired a trainer, and just re worked really hard through that year. And then 96 come round, and obviously knew the sevens was coming up, and uh, got, you know, 18 tries th through the tournament. I would love to have a, uh, the old New Jersey's and have a GPS on the old back and to see how much uh, miles I covered, but uh, I was pretty tired by the end of it, sitting there playing with guys like Jaina especially, it was pretty special. You scored a lot of tries, but you're also famous for one that a lot of people think that you scored, but mm. you actually set it up, you ran the length of the field, talk us through that. We were just under the pump. I think we had a scrum on our own, sort of five metres out from our own line and, and just threw the ball across the face. I don't know, you just put your head down and try and find a bit of space and managed to sort of get out between the middle of the post and gave it to the, the other big Fijian on our side and he, he ran away 50 metres to score. So, yeah, I mean, that's, one of my, that's my favourite try that I never scored. That is a touch of absolute genius. But great balance, hasn't he? I was just in the right, uh, right place at the right time. Marshall once again. Bunch with a lovely little dummy, Zen Zan Brooker, playing for Cullen. Yeah, I think there's a bit of a, not a hangover, but I guess a thing coming off the 95 World Cup. I, know, I guess a bit of payback going back over there and, you know, you knew it was going to be a tough, a tough tour and a tough series. Just back then it was hard to win over there. It was really, really hard and we knew we had four tests and you sort of had to win. We knew you had to win sort of the first couple. New Zealand has at last won a test series in South Africa. You remember the nuns and shit, they were... I don't know how far away, they're the back of the stadium, but just recognisable, they could stand out. So, um, come off the game and, you, you know, you obviously won the series and you look up and the boys are in their number ones, uh, you know, pumping out the hucker. So it's, um, I mean, yeah, I mean, pretty cool feeling. And obviously, you walk in and then, you know, obviously, you know, the old Don Clark's there in the, in the, in the change room. Like, couldn't get any better. Well, as a team, I was sort of always sort of that, uh, hurricane region type guy, I never wanted to really go anywhere else. Yeah, this 2000 one was, was pretty special. I remember an article Phil Gifford had written, and that was on our wall, and we had no chance. Uh, so yeah, and then we managed to hang on, so once again, it was just, you know, just a cool feeling, you know, obviously Jonah was there and, you know, scored that amazing try, and try down the left. That year was, was cool because we were ripped off and managed to come out on top, so uh, that's why I've still got that jersey. Now Marshall, away for Merton, Zura Mir, almost looked, did it, got it away to Alatini, Cullen the one stop him either, three tries in six minutes. Uh, so this is the uh, the 2000, uh, they say the game of century over in Aussie there against the Wallabies, 100 and odd thousand people there. Uh, and then the game, yeah, the game was just crazy. We were 24 nil up after, what, six and a half minutes, and then we were 24 all at half time. <laughs> it was almost like we went into shock. 
And you, you know, you think usually the other team would go into shock, but they just sort of held their head. The Wallabies was just a smart side. They had a pretty good side back then. So if you want one guy to have the ball tiptoeing down the sideline, oh, you know, probably Jane is your guy. Don't know if I was that keen on the one hand to put down though. <laughs> I've done that once and, uh, and dropped it, so uh, no, it was, it was good to see, obviously, man, you just like, oh, it was almost a thank God for that. Okay, guys, uh, that's my jersey tail. Uh, thanks for letting me share it. Special jerseys and a special player. Whenever people are asked who their favourite player is, that guy is always there or thereabouts, and he was for you, JK. Yeah, no, I was pretty... Bitter's probably the word. No, it's probably not the right word. I was pretty gutted that I wasn't um, selected. I got dropped from the All Blacks and really couldn't watch the All Blacks play. It just hurt too much. Um, and then this guy, Christian Cullen, came along and he just excited me so much that I couldn't not watch the All Blacks again. So he, he helped me fall back in love with the All Blacks, which is... Wow. I not even know, fell out of love with them, but I was just <laughs> gutted I couldn't play anymore. In the Wheeler household, it was either you were either Christian Cullen or um, Jeff Wilson. Who were you? I, I always was Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> Jeff, I was always Jeff because I, I wanted to be a cricketer and a rugby player. But yeah. it was either yeah, Cully or um, or Jeff, and I was yeah, no one had the footwork, the speed, or, or the skill of either of them. <laughs> Didn't matter but when you team though. I used to try them as best I could. Yeah, yeah, but yeah, fam fabulous. So many memories of those those guys, but Cully especially, mm. tearing defences up, unbelievable. Mm. You have fond memories as well, Charles. Yeah, definitely. I just remember. Um, Every time, you know, you get a new Weetbix box and you get the cards to come out, <laughs> I was exactly the same. I either wanted Goldie or, or Cully. So, so, same in our household, just an absolute legend and um, used to love what, watching him play. So Play for I, a I great really... amalgamated side too, the, the Central Vikings. Viking. I thought yeah. one of those jerseys were going to yeah. come up. I but... wish it did. <laughs> you know that feeling though, that excitement uh, that Cully used to give you? That's what I got at Eden Park yesterday, watching the Black Ferns play. We've talked about how, how much we were brimming um, with pride. How did you? feel, Charles? Oh, honestly, I am shattered today because yesterday was such an emotional day. Um, just, just everything about it uh, was, there were so many firsts for us as women's rugby players. I mean, obviously the first time having a home World Cup, the first time selling that many tickets to Eden Park. I mean, my whole career, that has been an absolute dream to see that happen for our women's game. And so many people you, you, come, you come across and you say that to, say that will never happen. Mm. And I've played games for the Black Ferns at Eden Park where the, the, there's just people scattered, you know, the, the crowd's not great, the marketing hasn't been done good enough in my opinion, um, and, and the crowds haven't been good enough. So to be there last night and to see our ladies run out at a Home World Cup, to lay down the challenge with that haka that they did is just absolutely spine tingling. Um, to have Rita Ora play, uh, the, the, whole, the whole day was just an absolute vibe and you mentioned it JK, it was, a, it was like a festival type feeling. There were families out, there were, there were just so many different types of people and crowds coming out to watch the best woman in the world play rugby. So just, just seeing that, uh, there's a lot of emotions, a lot of pride and um, just, yeah, I can't really explain it. <laughs> was the first 20 minutes then just because oh. of that? <laughs> well, that or was, yeah. is it the combination <laughs> between um, so many, seven errors in the first 20 minutes, but it was because they're still trying to find their style, or do you think it was just, gee, I've got to get through the haka, look at all this crowd, and just probably yeah. lost their way a bit? I think there's a few different uh, factors that, that contributed to that. I think in this team, there's, there's seven players that have played at a World Cup before, so it's not a hugely experienced team. We've never played against a crowd anywhere near that size. Um, obviously, the pressures of a home World Cup, we've talked about it a lot, about being able to absorb that pressure and walk towards it. But doing it is a completely different story. So, yeah, look, I think um, the girls in the first 20 minutes, obviously, were probably a little bit shell-shocked and they weren't used to the noise. Australia, that's the best I've ever seen them play. The Wallaroos came out and they, they were ready for it and you saw that the way they, they advanced towards the haka and they accepted that challenge. So, yeah, it took us 20 minutes to settle into it and, and being down 19-0, I think, in the, in the crunch time of the tournament, that's not a bad thing for us because we had our backs against, up against the wall. We really had to feel that pressure to come back and, order, and score 41 unanswered points. Um, obviously, Smithy gave them a pretty big rack up at halftime, I imagine. I've been a part of a couple of those. So, um, yeah, for them to come out and do that, I think that's going to go a long way. The business end of the tournament to know that 
when they are up against the wall, they've got the, the calmness and the ability to, to come back and get back out on top. They were down by so much, but what, one thing I did notice about their game last night, they, they don't kick a lot out of hand. Is that the, is that the plan going into this? Because against those better teams, the Englands, the Frances, is the territory battle when playing down the right end of the field, that's going to be pivotal, right? Yeah, it is, and we've done a lot of work on our, on our kicking strategy. We have, we've had um, Dan Carter come in a lot to work with us, which has been really good. Uh, um, and, and there's a few different plans. I mean, if you, if you know Wayne Smith, and he, he's one of the greatest coaches in the world, there's not just a plan A, there's a plan B and a plan C. So I think he'll, he'll be kind of adapting our game plan depending on who we're playing. To win the kicking battle against the England and French team is going to be tough. They, they are... They do have a, a better kicking game than they have for years. They're just better kickers out of hand. They get more distance. And we were, you would have seen that in the England and French game yesterday. So to get into a kicking battle with, with these teams straight out of hand off, off first phase in that is going to be tough. But Smithy have, has things up his sleeve to um, kind of move the back three around a bit more and, and manipulate them like that. And, and our girls are, are kind of working towards being able to do that against those teams as well. Something that was blatantly obvious uh, last night, JK, was the impact that the Sevens players had on this team. Yeah, I thought Ruby Tui um, was absolutely amazing, but not in the last 50, um, in the f when we were under the pump. Mm. She was amazing. She was just stepping up. I saw her just bash someone. And it was that sort of leadership at the time, I think, gave the girls, the other girls around, confidence to go... This, don't worry. And that's what I thought. She was amazing. She did some great stuff later, but it was actually, it's OK, we're here, we're going to stay in it. And I thought that experience is probably what you're talking about, saying that the front five probably haven't played like that before. And that's what they need to learn. They need to take the learnings out of the, la the first 20 minutes um, last night. Yeah, I, I agree about Ruby Toya. And what a lot of people wouldn't have seen and, and that she's so great at in a team space is when, you know, Young Renee Holmes made a couple of mistakes at, at the start of the game and, and I watched Ruby go way off her wing. She probably ran 60 metres across the field to go and have a quiet word with Renee and it's her being able to do those types of things to our girls who, who don't have that experience, who never played at that level. That's the, that's the stuff that you, you can't put a dollar on. Um, so, yeah, those Sevens girls have played in those envir environments before. They've played in front of big crowds at massive occasions, the, the Olympics, the Com Games. So it's that type of experience that they have that is, is going to help this team. And the Sevens players had a massive impact for Australia as well, didn't they? They had a big impact, Shani Williams and Benny Tiriti as well. This is the results after round one of the Women's Rugby World Cup. France uh, doing it over South Africa. Fiji at their first ever Rugby World Cup. There were smiles, there were tears and there were plenty of entertainment at the park as well uh, up against England. England though scoring 10 tries in the second half. When you look at the results, from the first round. Yeah, no, I saw that game. I, I'm more worried about France. I, I, I thought that Fiji, Chelsea, when they put it physically on the English, I thought, hmm, because I was really happy, because all I've seen is the Northern Tour last year, and I'm saying, oh, well. Yeah. And then I've seen um, the Black Ferns play last night, and then I watched Fiji really take it to them early. The trouble is with Fiji early is they just didn't score those couple of tries that they should have to put some scoreboard pressure on. But I think that there was, um, you know, there was some really good play from the Fijians and I think if you were sitting there like Graham Henry was watching it, you'd be going, OK, there's a few That's things we can attack there, Joey. Yeah, I, I thought they were impressive, eh? Like that, that, that natural instinct that the Fijians bring. But probably fitness an issue for them, staying in the game 80 minutes against a world-class outfit. We know how good England are and you need to be an 80-minute team to have a sniff against that English side. But I'm interested, what's the, what's the chat around the... Black Ferns environment because you know that you're going to come up against England and France towards the pointy end. What what are you thinking on review from previous matches? Where are they weak and where can the Black Ferns exploit them and and, and hopefully at home get the chocolates? Yeah, I think uh, J.K. nailed one of the things on the head and that's um, when when the Black Ferns beat England at the last World Cup and again in 2018 and 2019. When we beat England, we were way more physical than them. We could beat them up, and, and a lot of that was down to how ruthless our tight five were. Yeah. You know, just hitting rucks, hitting players, putting them backwards. So I think for us, seeing seeing Fiji do that to England, and, and that's you know that scoreline doesn't doesn't reflect that game to me because man, Fiji um, took it to England up front, and when they did it, particularly in the first half when fitness wasn't an issue, 
that's when they'd get gain against them. So, you know, well, the likes of Graham Henry and Smith, they'll be watching those games and, and I think they'll be in the ears of our of our type five and our, our players that have the ability to do that. We'll be down in the dojo doing more of that type of work. Um, England can be quite, quite robotic. They're very structured. So put them on the back foot, get them going backwards, make them have to play a bit more unstructured and that, that's how we'll beat them. Right. They play France. England and France come up yeah, against each yeah, other in pool play this weekend coming, It's the Charles. pool of death. It's, it's a crazy it pool, is. isn't it? Pool C at the Women's Rugby World Cup. But how do you see that one playing out? Would it be an upset if France beat England? It's, to me, it's, it's, it's really strange. France, France never look that strong to me until they play either the Black Ferns or England. <laughs> they just... They just go up and up. Save the best. Yeah. Save the best. Save Sound Save familiar? The best. Yeah. So, I mean, it's, it's going to be a battle. And I think the thing for our girls is we can't get too caught up in watching that this early on because we've still got our own game. So they leave that to Ted and, and, and Smithy and that to do that work and, um, and review those games later on. But, oh, this weekend, oh, I can't believe we get a game this good so early on. Very tasty. I hope it's Bastille Day. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> France have beaten me twice on Bastille Day and they get all... So tell them it's Bastille Day. Brewster's running around here. One round down, five more weeks before the finals. Do the Black Ferns change anything? Do they keep it consistent from here? Oh, to me, I, I think we're going to keep it quite consistent. Um, we've, we've shown quite a lot of consistency all the way through. There'll be, there'll be some girls that get around. There's a few girls coming back from injury as well. Um, really looking forward to seeing Kennedy Simon back out there. She's worked so hard to be at this World Cup and as a co-captain. So there's her and Alana Bremner to come back. So, But there's also the, the one that I'm really... I just don't know what's going to happen there. <laughs> wow. Aisha Letty Anger still has to come back yeah. from injury. Yeah, where does she fit in? See, she's been... the Best player in the yeah. world to me this year, but when you've got Ruby and, and Portia Wooden in there, that's an absolute headache, isn't it? But what a lot of great to problems. Have. How <laughs> lucky. Uh, that's, How why lucky. They got the, that's why they've got the professor in there to make those tough decisions. I know. Too. <laughs> yeah. We can't wait. Chelsea, thank you so much for coming in. Thank, thank you for you. your time. Uh, and we'll see you every week because you're going to be here giving us Rugby World Cup updates. Can't wait. Look Cheers. <laughs> Well, time now for trivia before we head to a quick break. Putting these guys to the test, your question for this week, who won the first NPC? Who won the first ever National Provincial Championship? Is that the 1923 one? 1976. A little bit later, 1976 oh. was the year. Do you know? Have a little think about it, and we'll bring you the Old answer bro. right after this. <laughs> <laughs> It goes straight to Poihepi. Cut out pass. Here's Fihaki up from fullback again. Oh, low pass. Beautifully picked up by Bridge. Muffy like coming across to make the tackle. Almost got the turnover, Northland, but Canterbury are in. Stacked away to the left here. Taipu. Plenty of space for Hobbit. Slings it wide. Garden Bashett drops it off to Savier. Trying to brush his way through. Got the pass away. And luck it is who scores the opening try of the game. Now off it goes for Tia Tia. Delivers a beautiful pass for Toala. He's got Weber and he's got pace. Oh yeah. He's got real pace, Brad Weber. And finally, Hawks Bay put it together. Right. Gets the ball away from the tackle. Last carry to fill up the middle. Everybody held off. Oh, and then a walking pass. Turned over and then walked away quickly to Bar Pretty. Leroy Carter. Nobody will run Carter down the seven superstar. That's why he's on the team. That's what he can do. And that's what he's known for. No, my hockey, my welcome back to the breakdown. What a great weekend of NPC. We'll get to the results and to the semi finalists soon. But first, the trivia question. We put to you the question and to these guys too. Who won the first NPC? The clue? It was back in 1976. Easy. What a clue. Easy. Andy Hayden. 
Peter Whiting, Sir Brian Williams, Steve the only Watt. Bloke that should Steve know Watt this. used to tow kick the only bloke from Prop, know this is you. Auckland. Why, I wasn't even, I wasn't even in a twinkle in my old man's eye then. Were I you? was just swimming. Probably still. But not. I'm going to go. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm going Marlborough. I'm just going with my home, my home province. Uh, I'd love to go Waikato, but I'm going to go Manawatu. I think that's a little bit around there, Golden Arrow. No, they had a good cowboy show. No, no, and yeah. no. Oh, no. Hey, Pink the country. biggest upset of the weekend. Hey! Here it is. The, the bay. The real oh, bay, oh, I should say. Real bay. Bay wow. of oh, Marlborough were ninth. One or two second. Oh. Close. Close, close. Cowboy Joey. probably got sent hey, off. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It was Waikato. You were just saying that was Marlborough's heyday, weren't you? No, I think it might have been <laughs> 10 years later. I think it might have been 10 years later. They have plenty. Those it was always Marlborough's heyday. Later. Yeah. Decades later. Yeah. Decades later. Yeah. Third division, when we won third division. <laughs> and just on the NPC, I mean, it's been a wonderful competition, isn't it? Because quarterfinals over the weekend, there were so many close results that went right down to the wire. We saw all that with Auckland and North Harbour. We saw that with Northland pushing Canterbury as well. Bay of Plenty, an upset over Waikato. You were there today. Yeah, and I think it's a credit to how they've restructured the competition. Last yeah. year they had seven in each pool, and you know you had an unbeaten team not being able to contest, but now we had eight teams in quarterfinals, and they were all so close. Yeah, well, you had an unbeaten team playing a team that had won one game. <laughs> in Southland last year in a semi, yeah. I, I, I know, it's ridiculous. So it's, I, I think it's been absolutely brilliant, and there's yeah. players that we see in these clips, like Sangster here and uh, Leroy Carter coming back from the sevens, they've been playing superb. These might be guys in our bolters for that All Black 15 we talked about earlier. Mm. Well, there's so much to play for, right, in all these teams. And I, I, that Northland game, I called that game, and it was yeah. a brilliant comeback from Northland. No one wrote them off. Everyone wrote them off, apart from those guys in that room. Like, I spoke to Matt Maddich after the game. He said one of their old boys came in and said they were really proud that they made it so far. No, even their old boys didn't think they'd make it, but they rolled up their sleeves, took it to the, took it to the dog pound, threw some punches, and, and came close in that, in that last, last 20. It could have gone either way. And Canterbury, everyone's thinking, they're the, they're the hot bet. They can right? be They, are, they have locked a million bucks, but they could be tipped up. And I think you'll have plenty of coming home with a wet sail, for sure. But, JK, your Auckland, they were good in the Battle of the Bridge <laughs> as well. Never write them off, you say, right? Yeah, and I think the, the nice thing about Auckland, the lucky thing, is we've got depth. You know, I think when Bryn got dinged, yeah. sort of changed the game a wee bit. I never feel sorry for North Harbour, because you North Harbour friends of mine, you know that the Battle of the Bridge... <laughs> is really, really important, but they've had a great season, really exciting rugby. I thought it would be a battle up front, but I watched this, the team and North Harbour would be coming off that game thinking we should have won that. Mm. Auckland hung in, I thought there was moments that would have changed the game, but that's what it's all about, and I think the depth in the Auckland squad probably wonder got them through. If, wonder if Auckland will get the ABs again. Wonder if they'll get the likes of Akita and Roger back for another week. No. Nah. Don't think so? No. Nah. Be good if they did. Would what you want to? Would you want to play? As well? North, North, there's a northern tour. Joey, just pop down and play for yeah. the province with your son. Yeah. Nah, ain't gonna happen. What, about what do you mean? Well, it's not gonna play. happen, mate. Would That's you want to go and play? Me and you, right? Yeah, probably. <laughs> so they'll protect the All Blacks, but what about the All Blacks 15 players? Will they be taken out of this competition, or will they be allowed to play? Oh, they'll have to play. There's not a chance sure. that they'll be able to take them out. They're still playing for you know their livelihoods, and every opportunity is an opportunity for them. But. Even those, all those games so close. The parochialism's coming back into provincial rugby, which I really like about it. That's the key part of Definitely. it, you know? No, but there are, that, I mean, that is one thing I've been critical of. You know, we talk about the Northern Hemisphere. Tribalism and traditionalism is fantastic. We've got to keep growing it. I think the competition's been great because we're all back together. Everyone's got a chance. But also, it has gone down to the wire. It's been really good. Rugby. Has it been as defensive as probably Super or Test Match? No, but who cares? Enjoyable we're there for watch. the entertainment. <laughs> That's right. Entertainment. Entertainment product, yeah. And that's wow, imagine that. Point. Imagine that. But that's always our point imagine of difference, that. right, as well. We're, we're, we're attackers. That's Here's our the point of DNA. difference right here, the three of you. Great entertainers on, you, on the show. We don't have very uh, much longer, but from each of you, we want a bolter. I know we said that there may not be one, but a bolter for the All Blacks 15. 28 players in name tomorrow. 60 of our best in New Zealand. Who will make that team that maybe we're not expecting? Oh, I like the look of uh, Leroy Carter that played there tonight, uh, today on, on the wing, and he can cover nine. I just think there's, there's, uh, he's one guy that the ball happens around him. He could, he could be in there. Nice. Lock is the concerning position for me if we lose Sam Whitelock and Brody Retallick in World Cup year. We need, a, we need to grow some depth there. So I'm going to go with a young lad out of Otago. Of Fabian course. Holland, the big Dutchman. Mm. Two metres 04, uh, has been playing outstanding for Otago. So he's going to be a bolter for me. 
a halfback that covers Wingman. <laughs> Only you could say that, brother. Oh, like, yeah, no, it was a fresh in my head. It just came from nowhere. I was like, how good. Put me on the spot. How good. Good. Hey, hey, that's Geordie Barrett. We're just going to chuck him in. First. The, he was actually the, the last line. player in my, in my vision, you see, so I just blurted him out. <laughs> no, I love it. I love it. Find your time to think. The young guy, Pew, I just think I just think he's been really, really good. Um, didn't know a lot about him. I saw him a couple of weeks ago, then I watched him again yesterday. Could be him. There you go. You've heard it here first. Tomorrow all will be revealed. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. We'll be back to do it all again next Sunday. Can't hide these cuts and scars. Whoa. Whoa.